Hello, this is our lecture number nine now. We're going to be talking about neurotransmitters and a little bit about hormones and how they seem to influence behavior. And uh, this is a, a subspecialty uh, in the area of psychology now, which is just gaining um, momentum and more and more interest all the time because a lot of the key questions, especially about those about uh, abnormal behavior, seem ultimately to be coming back to our understanding of the biology uh, of behavior and uh, treatments that are needed for individuals that are suffering from behavior disorder really um, uh, require that we understand um, uh, the biology of behavior. So again, this is a, another one of those areas that I think is uh, just, just so important. Let's talk a little bit about our brain as being a giant chemical factory. Um, and uh, it's constantly in a production mode uh, and uh, it's constantly producing um, uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, so again, think of your brain as being a giant chemical factory. Uh, and uh, these chemical mo molecules travel from one neuron to another neuron. And when we begin to uh, explore uh, the common neurotransmitters, the ones that I think have received the most attention, the ones that we seem to know the most about, serotonin, also called 5-HT, and dopamine, uh, uh, referred to as DA. Uh, but here are some of the other ones, uh, acetylcholine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, endorphin, oxytocin, adrenaline, noradrenaline, vasopressin, and nitric oxide. Uh, these are some of the more prominent neurotransmitters that have been studied. Uh, there's over 50 uh, of them, more being identified uh, all the time. Uh, but we're going to be focusing our attention <coughs> on, on some of these to give you a little bit of background Okay, in terms of um, uh, how these uh, very important chemicals that are released out into that synaptic gap um, are, are involved in behavior. And, you know, if you were to ask most uh, uh, psychologists today, uh, especially those that are involved in the field of what's called behavioral neuroscience, I mean, they, they would say that this is where things are really at right now, trying to understand what is happening in those small gaps in terms of the neurotransmitters that are being released and, and how critically they important, uh, critically important they are for both normal behavior um, as well as abnormal behavior. So again, let's let's take a look at this a little bit. And here are some of the major neurotransmitters and their functions. Take a look at this uh, adrenaline, uh, primarily involved in what we call the fight or flight uh, response. Uh, noradrenaline, very much involved, <clears throat> a neurotransmitter very much involved when we're uh, concentrating very uh, hard uh, on something. Um, dopamine, uh, very much involved in, in pleasure. Uh, you know, we're going to talk a lot about later on about addiction, and dopamine is very much involved uh, in the addiction process. Uh, serotonin, uh, a neurotransmitter that's very much involved uh, in mood. Uh, GABA <clears throat> generally has a, a calming effect uh, upon the uh, central nervous system. A lot of interesting research on acetylcholine and the involvement of acetylcholine in, um, in learning. Uh, and memory processing. Glutamate, uh, another neurotransmitter, uh, common neurotransmitter, very much involved in the understanding of, of learning and memory as well. Uh, endorphins, um, uh, involved in uh, euphoria, that, that sense of uh, excitement uh, that occurs. Uh, when we engage in certain kinds of, uh, of, of behavior. So again, this is just a, um, you know, a listing of some of the more common uh, uh, neurotransmitters that have been studied. Uh, and, um, you know, we're going to be picking up on some of this as we go along and, and, and talking about. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about drugs um, and, um, you know, how drugs really change neurotransmitter function. Uh, we can identify drugs as being either what we call agonists or antagonists. Uh, in the case of um, uh, agonists, 
uh, what we're what we're saying is that these are substances that occupy receptors and they activate those receptors. So again, here's here's a, an agonist uh, that we see here, uh, you know, occupying uh, a receptor and, and actually causing full activation. So it's mimicking the effect of a of a neurotransmitter, uh, and again, it's doing so at the postsynaptic area. We also have what are called drug uh, antagonists. And what they do is they suppress, they inhibit the effects of a particular neurotransmitter. Uh, here is a drug antagonist here, um, which is occupying this uh, receptor. So essentially you're, getting, you're not getting any activation um, at all. Um, uh, you know, obviously we can take a look uh, at what happens when agonists and antagonists are both present uh, in which you'll be getting some activation but certainly not full um, activation so again we can classify drugs based upon whether or not they have agonist qualities or antagonistic uh, uh, qualities um, here's a very simple example of some really elegant research that has been done by this psychologist here joseph martinez uh, Joseph Martinez has been studying learning and memory for a long period of time, especially uh, he's been studying um, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and its involvement in memory. And he's been working with lower animals, rats and mice, and here's an apparatus that he regularly uses in his work. Uh, this is called a Y maze where an animal is placed uh, here uh, and then is released and uh, the animal can either go to uh, this part uh, of this uh, maze or it can instead go to this part of the maze. And uh, what he does is uh, he reinforces, that is he rewards the animal, for example, uh, he rewards it to go to this side. When it goes all the way to the end, the animal will get a food uh, reward. Or he would re take another animal, instead train it to go uh, to this side, and the animal would receive a reward going there. So if it goes to the non-rewarded side, uh, it's not going to get a food reward, only if it goes to the rewarded side. So what he does is he trains up these animals. He trains them up to what we call a criterion, where they're making, let's say, 10 successive correct responses uh, in a row that they're going to the side uh, that, they, uh, that they should be going on in order to get their, their reward. Uh, and then what he does is he administers to them either an antagonist drug. In this case, the drug is uh, scopolamine. That antagonizes the effects of acetylcholine. Uh, or he injects them instead uh, with an agonist drug, uh, physostigmine. So if you take a look at this visual that you see here, when he injects the, at, the antagonist drug, uh, the, uh, the scopolamine, what it does is, um, it produces amnesia. That is to say, the animals don't remember the response. That is, they've been trained, uh, trained up to a criterion of 10 successive responses. But when they're injected uh, with this um, uh, uh, antagonistic drug, it's as if you know they have no memory whatsoever for the response. In contrast, if they are instead injected, and again, this is after they've learned the response, with um, this substance, uh, physostigmine, that's an agonist drug, it actually improves memory, and memory lasts an even longer period of time. So again, these are very interesting studies where you're manipulating acetylcholine, either suppressing it or um, increasing it, exciting it, and um, it has very distinct effects upon uh, memory processing. Now, let's talk a little bit about serotonin. <clears throat> Excuse me, serotonin, uh, also called 5-HT, is considered to be the uh, what we would call the workhorse neurotransmitter of the brain. It's involved uh, in a lot of different um, behavioral processes. It's involved in aggression, in violence. It's involved in appetite. It's involved in mood. Um, what you see in this diagram here are, are the major uh, serotonin pathways that's in the red that you see here. Here's something that's called the Raffae nucleus. Uh, and um, this uh, originates, okay, in the thalamus, uh, 
that's a major uh transition point you know for uh, uh serotonin a major manufacturing uh, area for serotonin um and it's it, it's impacting uh, the thalamus and it's impacting uh, the frontal areas, the cortical areas uh, of the brain. Um, the thalamus, again, is this gateway, and it's a gateway for sensory information uh, to the cortex. So it's like a valve. It's letting some information go to the frontal cortex and other information. It's suppressing uh, that information, for example, includes uh, serotonin. So it's allowing serotonin to go to some areas and um, at other times it's closing it off and not letting serotonin uh, uh, to go uh, to those key brain areas. <clears throat> One of the things that we know is that serotonin can have a dramatic effect on um, uh, decision making and how the frontal cortex ultimately makes decisions. And there's uh, a lot of uh, evidence for this uh, that we can take a look at. Uh, our ancestors have really sought ways of uh, opening our doors to perception by a variety of different ways, uh, by way of religious rites, by way of extreme sensory deprivation, uh, by way of uh, uh, hallucinogenics, uh, psychoactive drugs. And I want to give you some uh, concrete examples uh, of this. Um, uh, so that you can you can understand it better. Let's now take a look at some of these uh, concrete examples we referred to earlier. This mushroom that you see right here uh, is one that is grown in various parts of uh, Central America, Latin America. Uh, South America. And um, these mushrooms contain a substance that's called psilocin. And if you take a look at the biochemical structure of psilocin, it is very similar to that of um, the uh, neurotransmitter in our brain called serotonin. This is a natural substance, the psilocin, uh, that's in these uh, mushrooms. Uh, and it really acts like the neurotransmitter serotonin. And in a number of different cultures uh, in uh, Central uh, South America, Latin America, um, individuals will purposely uh, consume these mushrooms uh, in order to uh, produce uh, a change in terms of their behavior, it distorts their perception. Sometimes it's used for religious purposes, other times it's used by um, uh, uh, individuals for medicinal uh, uh, purposes uh, because it does have some pain uh, blocking uh, uh, potential. Um, uh, but it, it is for the most part taken in order to change the way in which you perceive uh, the world. Uh, and indeed it is a uh, desired state uh, on the part of uh, some individuals who, who routinely consume it. So, um, you know, this is all very interesting. I mean, this is a, a case of, uh, you know, purposely changing your perception. You're doing it by way of changing, really, serotonin in the brain. Your serotonin system is getting overloaded by the psilocin, okay, which is occupying these receptors and, again, producing this distorted perception. Um, here's another very interesting case uh, of serotonin in Japanese religious pilgrims. Uh, following isolation, Japanese uh, pilgrims experience a very dramatic uh, uh, rise uh, in terms of serotonin uh, receptors. And as a matter of fact, if we measure this on red blood cells, red corpuscles, this is uh, what you see. Uh, these little dots that you see here are, are really serotonin receptors. And uh, what happens in these pilgrims is that uh, their perceptions change. And again, it's a way for them to come closer to having a religious experience. And again, this is something that is highly desired as these pilgrims go to these beautiful mountaintops and they isolate themselves away from anybody else for extended periods of time. Scientists have found that uh, serotonin receptors dramatically increase. And this, of course, is a reflection of um, there being elevated levels of serotonin uh, in, the, in the brain. 
Um, so again, change in uh, uh, perception, you know, as a consequence, uh, natural change produced by isolation. Um, LSD, uh, a very interesting drug that we'll hear a little bit more about as we go along. Uh, serotonin binds on, uh, uh, excuse me, LSD binds on serotonin receptors. In other words, it unlocks, it activates serotonin receptors. And it very frequently is used by uh, visionary artists. It's used as a tool to kind of, uh, you know, it's a telescope into your mind, uh, if you will, uh, to a different state of consciousness that you would ordinarily experience. You can go mad for a few hours and then come back again. It is not something that I'm recommending, but it is used by some visionary artists. And this is a painting that was drawn by a Haitian uh, visionary artist who was using LSD. And again, they helped uh, this individual to go beyond the normal kind of visual experience uh, that they uh, would have. Um, uh, LSD, once again, binds on serotonin receptors. It overloads uh, uh, your brain. Um, again, not something that I'm recommending that you do uh, at all, but it is used by some individuals in order to expand their consciousness. Uh, this is Paul McCartney, uh, the very famous singer-songwriter, considered to be the greatest singer-songwriter in the history of music. Paul McCartney routinely used uh, LSD in order to uh, accomplish uh, much of his writing. Uh, again, considered to be the most prolific um, uh, singer-songwriter uh, uh, in, in the world. Uh, so indeed, this is uh, uh, another, I think, a very important, interesting example of how um, uh, we, uh, we can modify our serotonin system. Uh, in this case, by utilization of drugs, in other cases, by uh, isolation, in other cases, by consuming mushrooms, for example, that uh, have serotonin-like effects. Um, this is a uh, uh, common example of how we can modify um, our neurotransmitter uh, systems and produce a resulting change um, in our behavior, change in our mood, uh, change in our consciousness. Um, let's talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, uh, Parkinson's disease is something that's uh, suffered by uh, many individuals. It's something that's correlated with advancing age. Uh, here's two very prominent uh, individuals, Michael J. Fox uh, and Muhammad Ali, uh, before he passed away, both suffered from Parkinson's disease. And we know that Parkinson's disease is related to a deficiency in terms of the amount of dopamine that's being produced in this part of the brain, in the basal ganglia of the brain. Cells in that brain uh, area uh, begin to degenerate and they don't secrete um, enough uh, dopamine. And what you see as a consequence of that is this uh, um, uh, inability really to exhibit smooth and controlled movements. Um, Parkinsonian tremors, for example, where an individual will uh, uh, shake their hand, uh, their arm very rapidly. Um, these brain scans that you see here are very interesting ones. Um, one of the techniques to, to try to uh, elevate the level of dopamine within the brain uh, is, is to um, uh, 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 do what was referred to um, as uh, transplants, fetal tissue transplants. So what this does is it follows what happens to uh, dopamine in the brain. Once that transplant occurs, here is uh, the transplant that has occurred. Uh, anything that you see in uh, yellow uh, and in red means that there's a lot of dopamine that's being produced. Uh, and you can see that these scans that are taken uh, roughly uh, at one month intervals, you can see that more and more dopamine um, is being uh, produced. And again, this is uh, a remedy, uh, actually only a short term remedy because it doesn't last uh, forever, but it is something that is used uh, in Parkinson's uh, patients. 
so uh, indeed, this is a very interesting disorder, uh, and it is one that is related to this uh, deficiency that we see uh, in the manufacturing of dopamine in the brain. There is also a theory uh, referred to as the dopamine theory of schizophrenia, which uh, suggests that uh, schizophrenia is due as a consequence of there being uh, too much dopamine in the brain, uh, in particular in the frontal cortical area of the brain. Here are the two primary dopamine pathways in the brain. This is what called the nigrostriatal pathway that you see right here. And here's the mesolimbic pathway that's really going up even more into these cortical parts of the brain. And it's thought that this mesolimbic pathway that you see right here just isn't providing enough dopamine to this part of the brain. So schizophrenia is, you know, the, the, the complete shattering of a person's personality. Uh, they're very unpredictable. Their language is very bizarre. Their thought process has, has really been uh, almost completely shattered. Uh, and again, this dopamine hypothesis is saying that, um, you know, not enough dopamine um, or that too much dopamine is getting up into that frontal cortical area of the brain. So this is, you know, what it would look like in terms of a schizophrenic individual, and this is what it would look like uh, in terms of a normal individual. So schizophrenics, um, uh, the thought is that uh, 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 certain types of schizophrenia indeed may be related to this overactive dopamine system. We also have um, a very interesting phenomenon that's referred to as a runner's high, which is uh, related to um, the neurotransmitter dopamine uh, and um, endorphin. Uh, dopamine ordinarily is involved in regulating pain in our body. So whenever you have um, any kind of a physical injury, uh, the neurotransmitter endorphin uh, is being released. Um, uh, we know, uh, for example, that if you are participating in some kind of grueling events, uh, like, uh, for example, long distance running, that, uh, you know, a lot of this endorphin um, is, is being released. Endorphin is always also called endogenous opioids, okay? Uh, in other words, the chemical structure of endorphin is very similar to um, the opium uh, drug. Uh, and that endorphin binds on very special receptors. And again, here are the receptors and the distribution of those receptors uh, throughout the brain. Um, uh, and, and once they become occupied, they shut off certain neurons that allow more dopamine to be secreted into the frontal lobe area of the brain. So essentially what is happening in terms of uh, this, uh, uh, what is referred to as runner high, it's like an addiction. You become addicted to your own neurotransmitters. You become addicted to those um, endorphins uh, in the brain. Um, you see this interesting cartoon here. It says once the endorphins kick in, it's like heaven. Uh, and indeed um, we know um, that individuals who, who become very avid runners, um, they must run every day and because they want to feel that uh, rush uh, that occurs um, as a consequence of that endorphin, the endogenous opioids. Um, so uh, again, uh, something that's called runner's, runner's high uh, behavioral change, that's an addiction really that occurs to one's own neurotransmitters. You want to keep running in order to produce more and more of them. Dopamine also is involved in bliss. Um, the experience of infatuation, the early stages of a relationship between two individuals, the love potion almost is created with dopamine and noradrenaline that's secreted at very high levels. Um, there's a, a, a sudden rush of these neurotransmitters in the brain. It's reflected in the various behavioral responses like sweaty palms, a racing heart, flushed cheeks. Uh, these are all behaviors that really uh, accompany uh, love. Uh, 
the more primitive part of the brain, the limbic system, eventually is going to override this. Uh, the logic that is exhibited by the cortex is going to override what's happening in these more emotional parts uh, of the brain. But certainly during the initial infatuation stage uh, of a relationship, dopamine and noradrenaline are being secreted uh, at very, very high levels. Um, here's some, another interesting uh, piece of research. Uh, one of the things that we know uh, is that um, a lot of uh, attachment behaviors, parental behaviors, uh, uh, social attachment that occurs between uh, individuals, it's related to this hormone in the brain that's called oxytocin. Now, what you see here is a rat, a mother rat, that's recently given birth to her offspring. Uh, here she's showing this uh, behavior uh, where she is uh, licking uh, the anal genital region of, the, uh, of, a, of a young pup that's just recently been born. And this is done in order to stimulate the growth of muscles that ultimately are going to be involved in urinating and defecating. Here's a female that's exhibiting a nursing posture uh, over her pups uh, to allow them to suckle uh, from her. Again, this is a very important uh, maternal behavior that she's exhibiting. And this is a female that's retrieving uh, one of her pups to bring, uh, bring her back to the, uh, to the nest site. So these are all behaviors that we routinely see in females once they've delivered their offspring. But one thing that we know is that the, a female who is, a, let's say, a virgin female, one that hasn't gone through pregnancy um, and hasn't experienced all these incredible changes that occur in terms of hormones, they're, they're not maternal at all. They don't really display uh, these behaviors uh, that we see here. Um, so there's uh, uh, some very interesting research that's been done in which they've taken uh, females that are non-maternal, these virgin females who really just ignore an offspring if they're confronted uh, with them. Um, uh, they're injected uh, with this hormone oxytocin, injected it into the brain. And oxytocin um, has been referred to as the cuddle chemical, for example. And there's very interesting research showing that if you do this, inject this right into the brain of a virgin female, that they ultimately will become parental. Uh, if you take a look at this research uh, done by Robert Bridges at Tufts University, uh, you, sh you can see the percentage of these uh, females, these virgin females, uh, that for all intents and purposes uh, are not maternal. If you start giving them this hormone oxytocin and you inject it right into the brain, this is called an intracerebroventricular injection, uh, they become um, um, very maternal. Uh, this is the percent of them becoming maternal. Again, if you use increasingly higher doses, uh, that you get this dose-dependent effect where now many of them are becoming as maternal as a female who has uh, delivered, um, uh, gone through pregnancy and delivered uh, offspring. So uh, oxytocin, very important hormone in terms of, um, uh, again, classified by some as being a, a, uh, an attachment um, hormone. Uh, there are oxytocin receptors, obviously, in the brain. Uh, and if you take a look at this vole that you see here, uh, these are uh, rodents, uh, a little bit bigger than a mouse, a little bit smaller than a hamster. Uh, what you see right here uh, this is a montane vole right here, uh, which is coat color is um, uh, light brown, whereas this is a what's called a prairie vole. The montane voles exist in the mountainous areas of our southwest, uh, and prairie voles exist in the, the prairie uh, uh, areas. Um, if you take a look at their maternal behavior, montane voles are not very maternal at all. If a, you take a female that's just delivered her offspring and you scatter her offspring around her nest, she won't deliver, uh, she won't um, retrieve those offspring. Um, but if you take a, uh, a prairie vole, 
uh, like what you see here, they're very maternal, very solicitous of their offspring. They will very rapidly uh, retrieve their offspring if they've been scattered uh, around the nest. And when you begin to compare them uh, in terms of their brains, the montane vole has uh, very few oxytocin receptors, that's in the red, whereas uh, the prairie vole, excuse me, the montane vole, very few receptors, uh, the prairie vole, lots of receptors, meaning there's lots of oxytocin. So the behavioral differences that you see between the montane and the prairie vole in terms of their maternal behavior might be related, in fact, to the differences that we see in terms of the amount of oxytocin uh, that's in the brain. Take a look now at this very interesting figure. Um, prairie voles are very interesting. They're monogamous, meaning that when they mate, they mate for life. They don't have other partners. And one of the things that we know is that these hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin, that are manufactured in the brain are really very much involved in um, this monogamy. So one of the things that we know, for example, against once mating takes place, ordinarily that male and female stay together forever. Okay? But we can kind of disrupt this whole process by injecting various um, antagonists, for example, uh, to these hormones uh, in the brain. So, for example, uh, before mating, before a male and female actually mate, and again, this is a male that we see here, this is a female that we see here. If a male is injected with uh, vasopressin, uh, this male automatically now uh, becomes very attracted to this female, okay? If, on the other hand, you inject a female with oxytocin, right, the, the female becomes very attracted to the male, but the male is relatively disinterested, okay? That's if you took a male and a female prior to the time that any mating actually occurred. Now, what happens after mating? Well, if a male is injected with a vasopressin antagonist, as we see here, even though the female has love in her eyes, uh, this male rejects that female that it just mated with. Um, on the other hand, if you take a female and inject the female with an oxytocin antagonist, even though the male is very interested in the female, again, this is after mating, that female will reject the male. So again, you can modify that monogamy by simply changing um, these uh, hormones uh, uh, in the brain. So again, this is more uh, fascinating information in this area that argues to the importance uh, of these neurotransmitters in our behavior. Um, this is an interesting um, area of research that I've been involved in with some years, and that concerns the defensive behavior that uh, female uh, animals show after they deliver their young. They're very protective of their offspring, and if a strange male comes into their territory, they exhibit this very intense uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, where they bite and they attack the male. Uh, here's a, a female that you see here who's uh, with her offspring receiving uh, uh, suckling stimulation from them. She's nursing her offspring. Uh, here she is, she's built this wonderful uh, nest uh, for the offspring. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a strange male uh, to her territory. Uh, this is the male that you see right here that's been introduced. And, and we put a black magic marker uh, marking on that male um, in order to distinguish it from the female. And the female um, rapidly approaches the male, briefly sniffs it, and then begins this very vigorous uh, attacking behavior. One of the things that we know is that when a female is nursing her offspring, it activates what are called the spinal thalamic tracts that you see here, which culminates uh, in the hypothalamus and the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei, uh, as well as in other parts uh, of, the, uh, of the hypothalamus. Uh, and that is gonna activate serotonin uh, in the brain. Uh, so one of the things that we know is that if we block that serotonin with a drug that's called PCPA, then a female uh, 
uh, will fail to develop this kind of um, protective defensive behavior, this thing that we call maternal aggression. So indeed, this has some, you know, very uh, interesting uh, parallels to uh, some of the work that's being done um, in the area, for example, of what's called postpartum uh, depression, uh, which I'll talk about in just a few moments. Um, here's some other uh, interesting work done uh, by uh, another um, researcher um, out at the University of, uh, of, of Michigan, uh, in which uh, he's been manipulating this very interesting uh, uh, neurotransmitter called CRF. Uh, CRF is called corticotropin releasing factor. And one of the things that we know is that in order for aggression to appear, this maternal aggression to appear, um, a female um, must experience these very, very low levels of uh, CRF that ordinarily they go down almost immediately after the female delivers her offspring. Uh, but um, what this research has shown is that if you start to inject um, this uh, hormone, uh, right into the brain, uh, corticotropin releasing factor. What it does is it suppresses uh, uh, the aggressive behavior of these uh, postpartum uh, females. So uh, <clears throat> again, part of the reason why aggression gets turned on apparently is serotonin, uh, serotonin release. And um, part of the reason uh, also is this very rapid decline that occurs um, in, in CRF. So again, more interesting data, which as you will see has important clinical implications. Um, you know, understanding uh, neurotransmitter function uh, has helped us really to understand psychopathology. It's helped us to understand things like postpartum depression, for example. Um, Postpartum depression, um, or what some refer to as a postpartum blues syndrome, um, can be associated with the killing of one's own offspring, something that we call infanticide. Uh, here's uh, you know, one of the more outrageous uh, cases of this, uh, tragic cases of this, uh, Andrea Yates, who suffered from postpartum depression. She drowned uh, her five children, and this occurred after the birth of her, uh, of her fifth child. And um, she routinely had been placed uh, on uh, various uh, serotonin um, uh, blockers um, uh, in the brain. Uh, and uh, once she went off of them, she apparently exhibited this, uh, these very profound emotional changes and depression that led to uh, her killing uh, of uh, her offspring. And indeed, this is something that we see not only in the case of uh, human beings, but also uh, in the case uh, of, of animals. So clinical work now has really helped us to, um, animal modeling has really helped us to understand this particular uh, syndrome. This is a book that was written a few years back by um, a uh, celebrity actress by the name of Brooke Shields called Down Came the Rain. And it's really, uh, it's a, a diary of her um, uh, problem uh, of postpartum depression, how she tried to deal with it, how she coped with it. And um, she ultimately was helped by various treatments um, that were known to block um, uh, serotonin uh, in the brain. And those treatments were really based upon a lot of the animal work uh, that has been done. So uh, again, human psychopathology, we can uh, certainly uh, point to uh, animal model work as being very important in terms of helping us to develop remedies. Let's uh, lastly uh, talk about the work of this psychiatrist, Emil Corcaro. Um, who has been taking a look at the relationship between serotonin uh, and aggression in humans. And one of the things that we know is that in human beings anyway, low levels of serotonin typically are associated with high levels of aggression and violence. It's been some really interesting work that's been done in prison populations, for example, which has supported that particular claim. Uh, Carcaro has been working with individuals that um, have a short fuse, that constantly are getting into trouble. People, for example, that exhibit road rage. And he uses the drug Prozac uh, 
which is clinically marketed as an antidepressant. Um, to treat these individuals um, uh, to lower their aggression. And indeed, it's been very effective in, in treating those uh, individuals that have these uh, uh, periodic bouts uh, of uh, emotional change and mood that they simply can't control. Uh, what does Prozac do? Well, it increases level of serotonin in the brain. Uh, and it really, it seems to be very effective in terms of diminishing those uh, impulsive behaviors and those angry outbursts. Um, so our conclusions in this area, uh, I think, are the following. You know, our behavior certainly is rooted in our biology. There, there's absolutely no question uh, 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 in terms of the support of that particular claim. But, you know, we really don't know the extent to which <clears throat> neurotransmitters, hormones, shape and modify our behavior. I think we're learning more and more uh, all the time. Um, uh, and this uh, represents a, a very important part uh, of the field of psychology, especially in terms of our understanding of, of behavior disorders. Uh, so that really concludes, you know, this first uh, section, you know, of, of the course. We'll be, of course, having an exam soon. Um, but, um, you know, we're going to be moving on um, in our uh, future lectures to, to get into the one of the most important areas of psychology, uh, and that is the area of learning. So uh, that is what we will do um, in our in our next class.